right, so to help us understand a little bit more about uh, gloss and angles, I've got a laser pointer here and I've got those samples uh, sitting here. Now I've turned the lights down in the room a little bit so it may be more difficult to see some things, but it helps with illustrating this. Okay, so I've got a, the laser pointer, okay, and now I am projecting that, that laser right onto this uh, chrome plate. And you can see up on the wall the red dot. And as I move this down, so I am, say, going down to 75 degrees, 85 degrees, and you can see that dot moving down the wall. But as I increase that angle, so now I'm up to back to 75, maybe up to 65, and you can see that, that dot going further because it is just projecting that back up there at its specular level because this object I have here, this chrome plate, has a high specular component to it. Okay, so that's one illustration. The next sample is that uh, operator's manual uh, cover, back cover, okay? So you can see I'm projecting it right here at a low angle. So my angle on the wall is at a low angle. But then as I come up, you can see that dot go up. Now, the other thing you'll notice is that dot isn't as vibrant nor as focused as it was when I had the uh, um, chrome plate on here because we're getting more diffusing of light like we talked about over there, okay? Next, we'll come here to this magazine grate. All right, so you can see the magazine grate, and you can see, again, that dot's diffusing a little bit more. You can see a strong image here on, on, the, on the sample itself, but its specular component is going down, so it's going to have a lower gloss than the other two did because it's diffusing more light at the surface. Okay, then the last example goes back to that book grate. And you can see up on the wall, there's hardly anything there, if you can see anything at all. Okay, so we basically are diffusing all the light now, moving much further down the line towards that first image up there on the wall. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a, a nice visual of what we're talking about when we're talking about gloss and we're talking about these angles, okay? So now that you know we've defined kind of what the property is, we need to talk about how we're going to measure it. And so that's what this video is all about, about how in the industry today, how it evolved, how it started, how it evolved, and how we use it today. So if we want to look back at kind of the origin of really the first gloss uh, measurement, we have to go back up to the state of Wisconsin where so much of the work was done early on in optical, optical measurements of, of pulp and paper. And we go back to the Institute of Paper Chemistry. But now we actually go further back in time to 1914. So over 100 years ago, is when we're talking about the original work with, with this was done. And there was a professor at the University of Wisconsin, which is located about an hour and a half south of where uh, the institute was up in upper Wisconsin. And Professor Ingersoll had, had gotten a project with the U.S. Uh, Forest Products Lab. And they were wanting to measure this elusive property called gloss because they felt like if we could do a better job of controlling the manufacturing process, we can get a more consistent product out into the marketplace. So uh, Professor Ingersoll began working with the Institute of, of Paper Chemistry, and they came up with uh, an instrument. And this instrument actually measured at 57.5 degrees. Why 57.5? I do not know, but I do know the original instrument was set up to measure at 57.5. So again, think about the samples perpendicular, so 57.5. So somewhere about over here, there was a light source. Somewhere about over here was a, a photocell looking for capturing that, that light image with that. And so that first unit uh, was developed. And unlike the unit we call today, like a gloss meter, the term they chose to use was glare. So it was known as a glarimeter or glariometer. I'm not, I'm not sure which of the two it was, but it was, had that terminology, okay? And so the first company that actually began to manufacture this was a company out of Chicago, and it was called Central Scientific. And so they brought the first instrument to market for measuring this property at the time that they called glare, which ultimately we would end up calling gloss, okay? So that became kind of the, the instrument. And then there was a gentleman named Richard Hunter, and Richard Hunter worked at the National Bureau of Standards. And uh, he was a, a pretty sharp physicist in the area of optical measurements as well. And he was looking at the uh, glarometer, glarimeter. 
and uh, began to investigate, all right, so 57.5, but really what is the best angle? What agrees with human observation the best? Because at the end of the day, if you make a measurement and it doesn't agree with human observation, then it's really not relevant. And so he began to do a study on what angle could we set up in our illumination and detection, detection device that would allow us to agree with human observation the best. And so he did a pretty exhaustive study looking at many different angles uh, of, of uh, setting an instrument up at, at 85, at 75, at 60, at 45, at 20 to determine really what gave the best with visual ranking. So you would have a, a group of samples and you would have human beings rank those samples from the most glossy to the least glossy, if that's such a word, uh, and then you would have a group of people do that, and then you would measure them on instruments. And then which, ins which setup gave the best agreement, and that's the setup that we would go with. So after quite a bit of study and research, they found that actually not 57.5, but actually 75 degrees was the, gave the best agreement with human observation. So uh, Richard Hunter, set up the, the instrument. He worked for the National Bureau of Standards at the time. And so ultimately, Bosch and Lom Company got involved with the instrument. And they developed the first instrument that measured at 75. And it was called this Oxford value, Oxford 75 degree. They made some modifications to that setup. And then ultimately, it became known as the BNL modified Oxford 75 degree glarimeter. Now, Bosch and Lom was involved with it early on, and, and when we talked about opacity, Bosch and Lom was the original manufacturer of that unit as well. So they were very involved in the early days in the pulp and paper industry with the optical measurements <coughs> that were going on. So this 75 degree method became the, the standard method that was used in the industry. And so I've got one of our original instruments here. This is our T480A. And We'll zoom in on this and let you see it a little bit better. But in this, this is set up to measure 75 degree gloss, okay? So with that, you have a light source which sets right over here. This is the samples, sample sets here. So this is the perpendicular axis of the sample right here. So this represents your degrees. So you rotate 75 degrees and there's a light source setting here, okay? Then you rotate the opposite 75 degrees and you've got a photo cell setting here. So you've got 75 degree uh, illumination, 75 degree viewing is really what the first instrument was designed to do. So you have 75 degree illumination and 75 degree viewing. And why? Because that's how we define gloss. As if it's coming in at 75 degrees, we measure gloss at the opposite. 75 degrees, all right? Does that, make, does that make sense? Okay, so this was the original design of the instrument and became the standard throughout the industry and then eventually TAPI wrote a test method on it, T480, and that became the, the, the standard for, for measuring gloss in the industry. Now, within that, we talked the other day in the other video about measuring this blip that comes out, this axis here. And so within the standard, they defined the orifice of opening, the, the aperture of light that sets over the photocell so that you don't allow too little or too much of this energy to get through. So you define the amount of space that is. So within the standard, you can look. And so with, within the instrument manufacturers, we set this optical system up to mimic that standard to make sure we have the right size orifice for that light to pass through that, that aperture. Now, within the industry, you'll see that there's the tapping method, but you'll also see some other 75 degree methods. And the primary difference between method to method is the aperture opening that you have for collecting this light energy. So those will vary from method to method, but when they say 75 degrees, this is what they're talking about, but because that aperture can vary depending upon the standard, you will get a different in the reading for that. So like any other property, when you're communicating gloss, you have to define what angle am I measuring it at, what angle am I viewing it at. Those should always be equal. And 
basically what the standard method is because the standard method defines that aperture opening. Okay. So anyway, the 75 method became the standard method in the industry for, for making measurements. But as our technology improved in paper making and our, our coding and our calendaring, sometimes we got to uh, see disagreement when you got into the, the really highly coded samples like, like this guy right here, where the 75 degree method didn't always agree with human observation at that upper range of gloss level. So um, they went back to study that at, and then they found that instead of measuring at 75 degrees here, actually, the best agreement with human observation on highly gloss samples was at 20 degrees. And so they developed a second method, which was measuring gloss at 20 degrees, T653 is, is that method. And now with that, you've got a light source that sits here and a photocell that sits here at a much different angle than the 75 degree. And they, they, they found through study that that gave the best uh, agreement with human observation. So today in the paper industry, we have the 75 degree and we have the 20 degree. Outside of the paper industry, if you get in the graphic arts and paints industries, you'll see 85 degree, you'll see uh, 60 degrees, you'll see 45, you'll see uh, an array of angles that we don't use in the industry, but those have been determined to agree best with those products and those applications. So <clears throat> when it comes to, to measuring gloss, it's important to understand what is the in use application. Is it going to be a high degree of gloss? Is it going to be a low degree of gloss? Because all those things are going to affect how well an instrument is going to agree with you in my observation. So again, our instrument is set up where we've got a, a photo cell sitting here and it's looking for, for light energy being reflected off the sample which sets here and illuminated by a lamp that sets there, okay? So if, if a sample has a, a lot of glossiness to it, so like this instrument manual back cover, we would expect a lot of the light that strikes this to go back to the photocell, right? And so again, that photocell is set with a, a proper aperture. So you would, you would load your sample on there. Now this one actually has a vacuum hold down, okay, because the sample opening on the gloss meter is fairly large and when it's top loaded like this you want to eliminate any sag into that, that aperture. So this vacuum hoe down pulls a vacuum on that sample so it sets flat on that. I don't have a vacuum pump for that right now so we're just going to estimate these values just for illustration. So this has a gloss reading of around 93 or so. Okay. Now gloss is also a directional measurement. so. I always want to measure gloss in the machine direction, okay? And you can easily find that by just rotating it 90 degrees to see which is the higher of the two values and that's the one you want to go with. Although some in the standard will, will follow the true standard method where you will make a, a series of machine direction measurements and a series of cross machine direction and you average those values. Some people report gloss that way, others report it just strictly as a machine direction measurement. Again, if you're going to communicate that, you want to make sure you communicate that properly with either your system mill or your customer, whoever you're reporting the data to. So you're making sure you do that the correct way. So anyway, this one had a gloss of around 93 or so. This magazine grade that we had looked at earlier, that has a gloss in, this, in the mid, mid to upper 60s range. So you can see quite a bit of difference in those two. And then again, this book grade it's probably one you wouldn't measure gloss on, and sure enough, it reads about 6.4, so there's really no reason to measure something like that. So you will see in the paper making process that there'll be quite a bit of variation if you're doing a profile across the paper machine from, from the front to the middle to the back. You can see quite a bit of difference, and that, that can be due to how the, the coding is applied, how the calendars are working, whatever it might be. But it is good to do a profile across that because you can see quite a bit of variation in, in the paper uh, from front, front of the machine to the machine to the back of the machine. All right, guys, thanks for watching.